Chief of Aerospace Magazine, and uh, with me is Deputy Editor Steve Bridgewater and uh, Features Editor Bella Richards. And uh, welcome to Aerospace No Time, another edition of our monthly podcast and now video cast looking at global aviation, aerospace, and spaceflight news, and what we have upcoming in the next issue of Aerospace, uh, July 2024, now hitting the doormats. In the magazine, we cover everything from GA. To space flight, from airliners to airports, from air law to EV tolls. Uh, but first, we're going to catch up, and we're going to find out where, where have we been all this past month. So, Steve, you've been on, on uh, over to the states, haven't you? I have. Yeah, we say this every month. It's been a busy month. It has been the busiest of busy <laughs> months. Uh, I went out to uh, Ohio um, with our friends at GE Aerospace out um, to the uh, their engine production facility just outside Cincinnati. Uh, and also out to Peebles, which is where they do their engine testing. So Peebles is way out in the countryside, and uh, imagine you've got engines on pods in the, in the hillside there for testing acoustics and, and various reliability. So that they were really interesting. Whistle stop tour, pre farm wrote lots of information for our farmer blogs, but really interesting trip out to the states. Okay, and how about you, uh, Bob? Where have you been? Yeah, um, I finally went somewhere. I feel like the last few months I've We've been We've let you out of this. Yeah, but they've let me out, yeah. Um, no, this last Monday I got to go to a pre Von Braun press briefing with ADS Group. Um, and they, they cover like economics within the aerospace, aviation, defense, and space sectors. And I'll leave most of the information to our preview, but they were basically just giving a kind of update on the health of all these sectors, how they've been in the past 10 years, which obviously is quite broad. Um, but yeah, in particular, I think a really good news thing that was mentioned was that um, since 2013, uh, there's been 50% growth in each of our sectors, which I think is you know, really great oh, news. Okay. Um, they did kind of say on the downside, this year in particular, the UK isn't doing that well. Um, it's only expected to grow about 1% this year, but with growth in Brazil, India, and China, this is according to their chief economist, um, because they are ordering like the largest number of jets, the growth will really positive impact the UK. So I guess it will trickle down and hopefully increase, um, I guess, the health of our industry. But yeah, it was really good. Um, I'll leave the rest, I guess, the preview. But one thing that was really interesting is that the CEO of the Farnborough Far International Air Show was there and uh, was just kind of providing a brief kind of preview of the show. Um, but one thing I thought was really good news is that for the first time in 25 years, the air show has been completely sold out quite ahead of time. Okay. I, he didn't necessarily say whether it was exhibitors or um, just people, yeah. like guests, but I believe it's exhibitors because yeah, he said there's yeah. no space left. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really great news. Yeah. Okay. What are you today? Well, I've been, uh, I went to Duxford uh, for the DJI show, so it was great to get up to Duxford uh, there for DJI, obviously, uh, 80 years uh, since uh, DJI. Uh, yeah. So it was great to see the, the uh, sort of flying display, proper aircraft flying around, uh, Dakotas there, Rio uh, kind of lined up and boarding, boarding the aircraft uh, there, felt really good. Harlots and display for me, obviously, Spitfire. <laughs> um, but uh, DC three, uh, sorry DC uh, six. Oh, the Red Bull, the Red Bulls, yeah. yeah, and uh, the Rafale, the French Air Force Rafale, was tearing up the skies. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, just a great day out on on, on Dutch, but, uh, You know, weather cooperated. Uh, but right. Just just, yeah. just soaking up the atmosphere and having fun there at Dutch, Yeah, so that was me. Uh, also, FCAS Summit. We had our FCAS Summit in May. That was a high profile, uh, three three days of, of high powered air power stuff. We'll go, we'll, you'll read about it in the, the July issue. Uh, lots of good stuff came out of that in terms of uh, military aerospace, where we're going with technology, drones, loyal wingmen, uh, Tempest, GCAP, all most of it. So, yeah. yeah. And you, you also went, you had a bus with Claudia last week. You went everywhere. Well, I did. Well, initially, the week uh, you were at Duxford, I was at Middle Air Fest. So we shared some of the apps with Duxford. So we have a DC-6 as well and a Red Bull B-25. Uh, hit a little bit by the weather, not particularly the UK, but the 
weather in Europe, so some of the European aircraft couldn't get across. That was great. And I just had a week's, week's annual leave rarity. And of course, Busman's Holiday, I've been going to air shows and to uh, Aviation Museum. So did the Cywell air show, which was fantastic. Uh, you know, nice to see a new show on the UK circuit. Uh, then spent the weekend going to places like East Kirkby and the RAF Museum, and then this weekend just passed, I was at Old Warden for their first festival of flights, so epic three-day flying display, um, pretty much everything in the collection flew and loads of really interesting visitors as well, so uh, I'll come back to work for a rest. If I, I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like you know you're an ad geek when you take your week off to go to air shows and everything <laughs> You say this like it's a problem. <laughs> so, so that's it. So Steve is not allowed to go to any more air shows. So, uh, and the other thing we had last week was we had a number of our Aero Society lates. So we got a uh, Top Gun Maverick film night. Uh, absolutely fantastic what night. Well, it's, it's great to see Top Gun Maverick on the big screen. Who doesn't like, like Top Gun Maverick on the big screen? Uh, so, and we had Paul Tremelling, uh, ex uh, Royal Navy fighter pilot, Sea Harriers, Harrier uh, GR nines, and uh, exchanged tour with the Royal Navy Super Hornets, uh, giving us the lowdown on, on the, the difference between you know Hollywood magic and the real world of the fighter pilot. So he kept the audience entertained. Uh, is, it, is it the pilot or the plane? Well, <laughs> he says it's the it's the plane. Wow. It's the aircraft, yeah. Don't get into a fight. Don't get into a, in a fight with a fifth gen aircraft if you're in a three, <laughs> third generation aircraft. It's, it's not going to come out well. Um, anyway, that was that was where we've been up to, and we're now going to come round up the news. So uh, it's been an absolutely massive uh, sort of like a, a month for, for aviation news, aviation and space news uh, yeah. as usual. I'm going to I'm going to kick off with uh, news from Ukraine. Obviously, the conflict is still ongoing there. Big. Significant news in that. Obviously, everyone's talking about F 16s to Ukraine, mm -hmm. but uh, Sweden has said they are donating uh, a couple of their Saab uh, AW aircraft, the RAs, uh, which are Saab, based on Saab 340s, mm -hmm. as the country's first AW aircraft uh, to Ukraine. And that is a massive uh, kind of game changer in terms yeah. of aerial surveillance. Uh, in terms of linking their recognised air picture uh, together and, and also you know, linking in with these F-16s when they arrive. So uh, that's, that's a big, you know, I thought that was a, a pretty significant. Uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's massive news, you know, it's, especially with uh, Sweden just joining NATO as yes. well. It's, you know, yeah. it's a you know, good example of, of NATO pulling together. Yeah, and uh, it seems like they've got, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're upgrading with their, the, the, the global eye. So and they, they're, buying, they're buying, actually buying an extra global item they cook for the yeah. fact. Uh, and so yeah, well done, Sweden. Uh, what about you, Steve? What's caught your eye? <laughs> um, excuse me. I was uh, really taken with Electra's Goldfinch, which has actually yeah, completed its flight test now. For those that don't know, Electra, based in Virginia, uh, they've got a, a hybrid electric stall aircraft. So it is. It's called the Goldfinch, and it's got what's effectively called blown flap technology or blown lift technology. So. Think back in the 60s here in the UK, we had something called the Hunting 126, yellow aeroplane, and a bit like Buccaneer, which is blowing air across the flying surfaces, so effectively convincing the aircraft that it's flying faster than it really is. Uh, so they've done the flight testing on this now. Um, this thing will actually fly as slow as 25 knots. Wow. So it'll be almost like a sort of Storch type performance on this. Uh, land in, uh, in 114 feet, take off in 170 feet. And so far, they've got nearly two hours endurance out of this thing. It's, um, it's a really interesting concept because it's quite a large aircraft for that stall performance. You've got an aircraft which can effectively land in a, you know, not quite the same space as a helicopter, but it's a really usable. And we talk about the advanced air mobility EV toll market. Well, maybe this is that crossover between EV toll and regional air mobility where you, you've got something that's really a usable tool. Yeah, okay. yeah, well, one to watch then. What about you? What have you been keeping your, your eye on in space? <laughs> What's going on in space at the moment? There is a lot going on in space. Um, I'm sure everyone has kept up to date with the Starliner launch um, and <laughs> uh, consequences of what's been going on so far. Um, but yeah, I know everyone would know that it will launch on the 5th of June, um, docked with the ISS just 24 hours later. Um, but there were some issues uh, with the docking. Like example, the service modules, um, a bunch of its RCS thrust thrusters had some malfunctions and then obviously the ongoing um, helium leak with the propulsion system. Um, unfortunately, this has led into some issues with getting these astronauts back um, onto 
to Earth, so they were supposed to return, what, like, a little while ago, at this point. Oh, yeah, it was supposed to be a 10-day mission, and yeah. now it's obviously well exceeded that. Um, so the five, there were five, I believe, thrusters that ended up malfunctioning completely. NASA and Boeing were able to restore four of them. One of them won't be used at all when it undocks. Um, but they're currently now, as we literally speak today, from the 2nd of July, they're going to be completing a two weeks worth testing from the ground, though, um, in New Mexico. So they've completed some hot fire tests of the thrusters just to test how they're going in space, but they want to do even further tests on the ground. NASA said this will expose Starliner's thrusters to flight-like pulse counts and thermal conditions for ground beams to inspect and analyze and see from there. Um, and they don't, they're not putting a launch date, oh, sorry, an undocking date um, as we speak, which I think is a good idea because I think often they'll set one and they end up Let's manage not expectations. getting it. Yeah, yeah um, so obviously everyone's talking about this and I think it is really interesting. Quite a lot of people have been kind of saying, you know, they're stranded. Um, NASA has made it very clear they're not absolutely stranded. They can still get back. But something that was really interesting that I saw on LinkedIn and I just want to quickly add in. So Stephen Herschel, and I could be saying his name wrong, he's a chief engineer for aeronautics at NASA headquarters. And he was kind of commenting on the reporting and how, you know, the big newspapers are saying they're stranded, they can't get back. And there is, you know, there's a, a level of reality to that. But ultimately, because quite a lot of people are upset that they're taking even longer to do ground testing. But I think what he pointed out is people have to remember the service module where the main issues are happening, once they undock and leave, that will, you know, that will never be recovered. That's not the bit that will be able to get testing on Earth when it gets back. So they actually need to do the testing now while they're in space oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because they won't be able to do that later. So it, it sounds annoying. It sounds like, oh, they're extending their mission forever. Uh, but they have to. Otherwise, they're not going to know what, what happened. And they're not going to be able yeah. to fix the issue. So I think just to bring a bit of level to the, yeah, the, sure. the reporting and just, you know, there, there is good reason, even though it adds to the many woes of Boeing right now. But hopefully they can figure stuff out. And I guess, as we say all the time, it puts into question their launch schedule, which... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, that was really long. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a good job uh, somebody who's got an article on rescue in space in the late, 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 latest issue of Aerosmith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Topical. Yeah. So, uh, keeping on the theme of space, we also have the Starship launch, yeah. uh, Starship Super Heavy, uh, fourth, fourth flight yeah. test, uh, and uh, wow, uh, what a what, a, what another show! Yeah. As, as Elon Musk always says, so excitement guaranteed. <laughs> uh, and this this was uh, somebody incredible. I mean, people, people were there sort of saying, "This is enough." You know, this will keep hypersonics uh, experts uh, busy for, for decades, writing papers on this of seeing. Uh, so the the super heavy landed or did a, a soft landing. Yeah. So the booster came back uh, in the sea uh, and, and came out and uh, 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 landed successful. That's that's it's incredible, it's incredible enough already. Uh, and then Starship uh, came down as well and did the re-entry. And there was uh, some kind of problem with what looked like the one of the wing flaps was was, was burning through. Yeah. You can see it on the video and. Uh, it's still stable, yeah. yeah. Still, flight control was still be able to, to, to which is what you want to see. You want to see, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this thing had almost, 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 uh, you know, burned through. And you know, I was looking at that thinking, you know, gosh, uh, you know, usually when you see uh, something of that, you know, any kind of tiny, uh, you know, defect or something going quite slow speeds, that's it, it's game over, you might as well go at home. And it made it through. Uh, so that's, and we saw the footage of it coming all the way down. I want to know who made the camera. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, <laughs> that's equally that's impressive. True. So incredible, uh, incredible boost of confidence, I think, in there. And it sh I think it shows you know how, how kind of over-engineered mm. it, it, it is in, in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. So they'll be looking into that. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the cadence now of, of keep flying as, as soon as possible. You know, it's just incredible. So yeah, I mean, that, that was a really amazing you know, yeah. flight. Uh, yeah. What else have we got? Um, I've got an Amazon story. Oh, um, Amazon. Okay. So Amazon, uh, parcel delivery, uh, they've recently received FAA approval for beyond visual line of sight operations yeah. in the US. Uh, so for a while Prime Air has been delivering from the hub to houses and addresses within sight of the, of the freight hub. They've now got um, permission for, from the US to do beyond visual line of sight delivery. I think that's, that's a really interesting 
development. You've got the, uh, the they've got they got their own onboard detect and avoid technology, and um, they're looking to roll this out across Texas and California. But interestingly, they've said they also intend to roll out drone delivery in the UK wow. and Italy by the end of 2024. Now, this probably oh. won't be beyond visual line of sight, but at least yeah, this is a grand. We, we've talked about this last mile delivery for a long time. And I think you know, when the, the big guys like Amazon are getting involved in this, so it's a, 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 a really important move. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. What about you in, in, in terms of uh, any more of the stories? Cool yes, uh, one more space story, what's new. Um, a really cool company that is definitely one worth looking out for, a Stoke Space. Um, they are based in Washington, um, in the US, obviously. <laughs> Um, no, I'm not Stoke on Trump. Yeah, Stoke. <laughs> yeah um, so they are developing a fully reusable two stage rocket, um, which in itself is significant because obviously no one else does that other than SpaceX. Um, they completed their first uh, successful hot tire, a uh, hot, hot tire test, hot fire test. <laughs> oh my goodness, I need to slow down. Of its engine. Um, so on the 11th of June, they completed the test of its uh, full flow staged combustion engine at Moses Lake. And the engine successfully ramped up to its target power level, producing the equivalent of 350,000 horsepower. How long did say that? Horsepower? Even yeah. horsepower? Yeah. Anyways, um, in less than one second. Um, and they're going to be completing longer duration tests later this summer. And so it's of their Nova rocket, um, which, as I said, is a reusable two stage one. Um, and interestingly, so the full flow stage combustion system is actually only used on SpaceX's. Uh, Raptor engines, which are only Starship vehicles. So this is the only other company trying to do this, and it essentially, um, when it essentially works, where both engines fuel and oxidizer, so liquefied natural gas and liquid oxygen, they go through separate pre-burners before going into the main combustion chamber, and this offers greater efficiency and longer engine life, but it's a lot more complex to make. So that's why a lot of other companies probably haven't attempted this. But clearly it's worked a lot for SpaceX, and so Stoke Space really wanted to do this um, to make it a more efficient, reusable um, system. So yeah, they're a really cool company, and I'm excited to see, hopefully, that they would be able to complete this soon and be another you know, medium lift uh, vehicle available for um, commercial companies. Wow, okay, so, excellent. Um, so yeah, we've got a bit of we've got a bad news, a bit of a setback for uh, environmental or sustainable aviation with universal hydrogen uh, going bust. So uh, that was a US uh, company. It was from a former CTO of uh, Airbus who put that up, and their thing was uh, hydrogen power uh, for using hydrogen as a fuel. <laughs> But using it, loading on in kind of pods or kind of almost batteries. Uh, so the idea was instead of having it, you know, fueling it up and putting a pipe in there at the airport and, and uh, having this uh, cryogenic fuel, uh, you would you'd have these sort of self-contained uh, almost batteries that you would shove in the back, uh, almost like kind of cargo freight containers. Uh, they'd flown a Dash Eight uh, last year. Uh, did a successful test flight in the US uh, with one engine converted to hydrogen. Looked like they were, they were on, on track to, to, to get uh, going to go somewhere and uh, just got bust. Uh, couldn't get the funding. Uh, apparently, we're trying to get some of it, some funding. But now, obviously, that's a bit of a setback. There's other there's other players there in the hydrogen space. Obviously, uh, Airbus is, is is looking at it as well. But um, one uh, one concern there is, is is if they can't get investment, does that mean the the, uh, the whole uh, investment landscape for advanced air mobility for sustainable uh, aviation is, is, is kind of getting a bit more difficult. Uh, you know, investors, you know, where, where, where is this money going to come from? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of a setback there, and uh, we'll see what happens with, with the other kind of uh, companies that are working on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's our news up to date. Uh, we're going to take a break now. We're going to go over to a brand new segment of the podcast. Hello, I'm Tim Robinson, Editor-in-Chief of Aerospace uh, Magazine here at the Royal Aeronautical Society, and I'm delighted to be joined for a new segment called a Specialist Group Insight on the No Time Podcast. Uh, and I'm joined today by Seth Moffat, who is the Chair of our the, the RES Flight Operations Group, one of our Specialist Group. Welcome, Seth. Thank you very much, Tim. Lovely to be here. 
Yeah, Seth. Now, now you, what, what's your background? You, you're the chair of the RAS Flight Operations Group. We're going to go in that, the, in, into that a little bit and discuss what what you guys do. But what, what's, your, what's your background uh, and, and, and career? Yeah, well, I've had sort of two parallel careers. I, I learned, I, I, first of all, I was born and raised in the UK, uh, and I learned to fly in uh, Canada uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, and, 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 and had basically two parallel careers, really. I had a career in flying, uh, of course, and then another career in uh, airline operations and management, uh, which led to uh, uh, being involved in a couple of startup airlines uh, uh, over the years. Uh, I, um, it, it, the, the job took me overseas, over to Asia, uh, North America, the UK. I flew for British Airline for a while. And um, uh, I owned my own operation for a while. I had my own small uh, um, uh, flight operation for quite quite some time uh, here in Canada. So, um, yeah, it's been an interesting career, to say the very least. Uh, when I was based in London, I got involved with the Aeronautical Society, uh, which, uh, which was fantastic. I, I got to know the guys on the, the flight ops uh, specialist group. Um, I guess that was about six or seven years ago now, and started attending the meetings um, and getting to know everyone. And uh, I've found myself now in the uh, the chair position, which is great. Fantastic. Okay, so um, for for anyone who is just, just sort of dialed in, doesn't know the Aeronautical Society, uh, we've got a great range of things we do from outreach to publications to the library. But what are the specialist groups? What what, what are the specialist groups? What do they do? Well, we, we have over 20 specialist groups uh, within the society, uh, to, uh, covering a range of uh, specialties under the aeronautics and uh, aerospace umbrellas. Uh, everything from uh, aerodynamics to uh, flight simulation, uh, uh, weapons systems, human factors and, and space, and that's to name only a few of them really. Um, our group specifically, uh, of course, focuses on uh, flight operations. Uh, and the aim of our uh, specialist group is to build, or, sorry, the aim of our specialist groups within the society rather, is to uh, build communities of uh, common interest really, uh, and allow experts in each area to come together, share ideas, network, uh, engage in, in research projects and thought experiments, uh, all aimed at the continuous improvement uh, and advancement of the field of aeronautics uh, and also the professional development of our membership. You know. So the, these are all groups of uh, volunteers. So you're, you're all kind yeah. of uh, giving your time for free on, on these groups. Uh. Y yes, that's we great. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, the flight operations group. That, that I'm thinking that's that's mostly on the the civil side of things, the the airline and and, and safety uh, side of things. Is, Primarily, right. yeah, yeah, air transport. So the, the term flight operations can be used to describe a, a broad range of activities, including, uh, of course, the physical flying of the aircraft, uh, the control uh, and monitoring of the aircraft by other means, you know, avionics, autopilots, uh, and basically the conduct of the various uh, organizational components required to operate an aircraft safely and effectively. Uh, which would include things like uh, flight planning, flight monitoring, cabin operations, uh, human physiology, uh, flight crew training, and uh, uh, and things like that. Um, flight operations, you know, they begin well before uh, the passengers and cargo are loaded, uh, and they continue through the uh, uh, the entire flight uh, and functioning uh, long after the passengers have disembarked and the cargo has been unloaded. So flight operations really is an ongoing thing. Uh, so really, uh, our group covers a, a large number of incredibly interesting and uh, constantly evolving subjects directly and indirectly involved with uh, the operation of uh, uh, passengers or, or cargo transport aircraft. How many, how many, how many members then are involved, and what, what are their sort of backgrounds as well? You've got members from around the world, presumably. We do now, yeah. Uh, well, I suppose we always have, um, uh, but post-COVID, our meetings moved online, which has been uh, uh, quite good for us in that respect. We have meet, we, we have members joining from uh, uh, all corners of the earth now, which is which is excellent. Um, we have 53 members. Uh, uh, of that, 15 are on our uh, committee uh, and 38 are uh, members. And then at each uh, uh, meeting we have, we have various guests and so on that, that, that join uh, uh, to get involved. Um, the range of experience is astounding, and I couldn't even uh, list it all here. We, we, we have uh, members uh, from regulators. Uh, we have members from uh, senior uh, airline management positions, uh, uh, training people. We have uh, retirees who were former chief pilots of British Airways and, you know, all sorts of things like that. So um, our, our group is incredibly diverse. Um, uh, we bring uh, quite a lot to the table, I think. So this is this is amazing, amazing group of experts to to kind of draw from and, and knowledge and experience and to kind of really sort of inform your your activities. So what what sort of activities, what sort of work and, and, and output uh, do you do you guys do? Well, what what's the kind of 
What well, we, well, we, yeah, well, we, uh, well, we meet every two months, uh, currently via Microsoft Teams, and uh, we usually invite interesting uh, guest speakers uh, from the industry to come and give uh, presentations to our membership on their particular area of uh, flight operations. Um, this usually ignites a fairly lively discussion, and uh, our members take that knowledge away uh, with them, uh, uh, you know, when they can use that in the future. Uh, the speaker then gets the opportunity to network with our membership uh, and vice versa. Um, we, uh, uh, at, at our meetings, we also have specialist working groups who um, uh, give updates and, and what they're working on and things like that. Um, outside of that, uh, members involved uh, in specialist working groups within our, uh, our group, they organize themselves in such a way that they can uh, share their ideas and work on specialist papers and things like that on an ad hoc basis between meetings, you know, as they, uh, as they have to get together and, and, and share information and collaborate. So. Yeah. yeah. So, so you've been, you've been. I mean, you've been, uh, you know, influential then in in helping sort of shape, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, well, I mean, sh shape the future of sort of a, a sort of a, sort of aerospace and aviation. For, uh, thinking things like uh, you know, sort of training standards and uh, in the past and sort of ev evacuation procedures and, and, yes. and really sort of like, you know, putting putting these things out before anyone else really. Yes, that's exactly right, uh, and that's, I mean, that's why we exist really, is to sort of stay on the, the leading edge of these, these, these ideas and these concepts and, and, uh, uh, and to produce uh, output that, that can go out to the industry at large and, and be useful uh, in, in moving things forward and, you know, keeping people safe. And also being being sort of obviously uh, media sort of talking heads and, and being being the, the kind of experts there that that uh, you know perhaps uh, mainstream media to can, can come to you know when they, when they need someone who is that that credible that impartial and that that really sort of knowledgeable uh, expert. We 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 do a bit of that. Yeah, we, I mean we we have to be a bit careful there of yeah. course uh, uh you know quite often uh, there's a high profile uh, media event an accident or something like that and it's in the news and 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 naturally uh people want immediate answers uh but one thing that we find in flight operations is there's a, an entire orchestra of departments that come together to to get an aircraft uh, off the ground and uh the the causes uh, of a lot of incidents and accidents are usually not obvious, even though they might seem at, uh, at first glance, there's usually more than one component involved in, in, in an accident. So what we try to do is we try to stay away from speculating and uh, uh, getting into things like probable cause and things like that. There are other people out there in the world that do that on, on the news and, and things like that. But what we'll try and do is uh, stay fact based. You know, so so recently, uh, for example, there were some high profile turbulence events. Um, uh, we didn't really get into what may or may not have happened there. But what we can do is we can discuss what turbulence is and we can help educate people and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, now, it, after a high profile event, if you fast forward a year or so, there's usually a, a report issued. Uh, which has been um, um, investigated and, and now we have the facts. At that point, it's a great time for our group to kick in and uh, look at the facts and, and sort of digest them and, and, and move them forward that way. So. I think, yeah, brilliant. I mean, I think that's a really important thing to sort of stress there is to, to, to avoid the sort of speculation. And, and as you say, yeah. you know, sometimes the, sometimes the, the, the immediate uh, conclusions are completely, completely wrong uh, that, that people jump to. They usually are, and, and, and you know, it, um, uh, it it doesn't do the industry or the people involved in these incidents any favors if if we jump in and start uh, speculating on what may or may not have happened. Uh, we we generally sort of sit back and, and wait for the investigators to do their job, and uh, uh, and then they provide us with the facts, and then once we have those, then we can sort of kick in and start to digest them and move forward. Okay, and for anybody who. You know, if you're if you're uh, listening to this or watching this, uh, and you you are involved in the the uh, airline industry, or you're a safety expert or an airline uh, pilot, uh, how, how does one get involved? Uh, what what's the do, yeah, do the, I need to be you know at the top of the, my game? Uh, well, we'd prefer you were. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly. Uh, uh, it, you know, we like to think we are, but um, the uh, the best way to get involved is to contact our membership chair, uh, who's a, a lovely gentleman by the name of uh, Captain Peter Thomas, uh, and he has an email address. It, it's uh, pthomas738738 at uh, hotmail.co.uk, I think, but I think I can provide that to you and we can put that in the, the, the comments under the, 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 the podcast in the future if you like. Uh, but what he'll do is he'll steer uh, anybody who's interested in the right direction. Uh, and what we normally do, generally speaking, is we invite uh, interested parties to come and join a meeting as a guest. 
right, and they'll okay. sit as a guest, yeah, for, for one or two or three meetings uh, and see if they're a good fit for uh, us and we're a good fit for them. Uh, uh, and if we are and they want to continue, then uh, usually that leads to an invitation to join our membership and, and go from there. So. Oh, what was the what was remind me of the time commitment as well that uh, you were looking for? Well, it it varies. You know, um, it it depends on what we're doing. Uh, academic, big academic studies and things like that can be quite uh, uh, resource intensive, and they can take a lot of people's time. But we do recognise that we are a group of volunteers, so we we have a, a broad range of of, of uh, uh, people on board. We have retirees who have a fair bit of time to work with. Uh, and we have people who are working full time in the industry who don't have much time to work with. Uh, so really, there's no requirement per se. Uh, uh, really, it's just a, a question of uh, if you have something to contribute to the group uh, and you contribute what you can, uh, then we're usually fairly satisfied with that. Is there, is there any sort of uh, a particular, I don't know, uh, skills or I don't know, maybe geographical areas where you're, you're, you're particularly looking out for new members? Is there, is there there's some sort of thing, oh, gosh, we could really do with someone from... Uh, who has a background in X or yeah they are there are um, we and things are evolving now so when I when I first joined the flight ops group uh, we were having in-person meetings at Fort Hamilton place uh, in London every two months and uh, they were fantastic uh, but they were they were generally sort of UK Europe centric uh, because most of us who could attend these meetings were in the UK or in Europe you know uh, um, and there was a lot of focus on on, on issues in that region. However, uh, post COVID things have moved online and the, the attendees, uh, that we're seeing in the group are far flung. They're all over the world now, which is incredible to, to see. So we're actually kind of evolving. We're going through a period of evolution now, uh, after COVID, uh, where we're seeing, uh, this more diverse membership group and organizing ourselves a little bit differently, I think moving forward. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I can't say, uh, off the top of my head right now, which geographic regions and so on and so forth, we would be targeting, but I can say that, uh, we would certainly be interested in hearing pe from people, uh, anywhere in the world now really, uh, and growing the group, uh, uh, to sort of encompass that, that, that global, uh, uh flight ops realm. Wow. Okay. So that that's that's your that's your invitation there from any any airline <laughs> pilots around the world uh, get involved here now. Uh, so um, this is this is fascinating and and obviously uh, lots of things going on in 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 the world of airlines in the world of safety at the moment. What are what are the biggest topics that Fog is looking at right now? Um, gosh, where where to start? I was going to say, where, where do I begin? Uh, uh, there's a lot going on out there right now. Everything from uh, GPS jamming and spoofing to high profile turbulence events and uh, 5G and all these sorts of things. Um, however, I, I would suggest that uh, one of the bigger topics on our mind at the moment uh, is the, uh, the changing technological landscape uh, that we're dealing with and the discussion on single pilot flight operations and autonomous flight decks uh, and so on. Uh, as you can imagine, a large chunk of that topic falls squarely in our arena. Uh, and it's a highly emotive topic uh, as well as the stakes are obviously very high. Um, so it, it, it can really, uh, people can get quite emotional about it. Uh, that said, uh, we're, we're still looking at this uh, and learning as much as we can right now in order to be part of that conversation, you know. Uh, and, and to be clear, you know, we as a group, we aren't currently taking a position on whether or not the industry should or shouldn't pursue these technologies. That's not why we're here. Uh, we're mainly uh, uh, attempting to understand and stay abreast of the changes and, and understand the propositions and, and weigh in you know, where necessary. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, I think we could and probably should do a whole episode on that one day. That's a whole, uh, that's a whole topic in and of itself. So that's, that, that's quite a, a big piece of what we're discussing at the moment. So that's going to be the biggest change really since, uh, what was it? It was, it was the navigator that was, uh, the last, uh, in, in the three person cruise was the last per yep. two, two person cruise. And then, that's right. uh, and with then, the, that, and it's like, to be, yeah, yeah. Sorry, with the advanced flight management systems and so yeah. on. Yeah, but it's like it's likely to be it's likely to start to to to, to start with with something along the lines of reduced cr uh, crew in the crews. Uh, so relief these crew, are, Rob. Yeah, these are some of the the ideas that are being proposed. Uh, yeah, you know, and 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 none none of this is happening right now. These are just sort of things that are being discussed. Uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, anyway, uh, no one's doing this. Um, uh, but we. Uh, as a group, certainly are trying to weigh in on the conversation and, and listen to uh, various stakeholders and, and 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 understand what's being proposed and 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 how it's uh, how it's being proposed and uh, and see where we can be involved and uh, if we should be. 
Yeah, well, okay. And, and obviously, the other one is GPS jamming. I mean, that's, that's in, the, in, in the news as well. People avoiding airspace, rerouting around airspace and, and, and sort of systems failing. And, and uh, also, that the, there's this kind of a, not, not just jamming, but GPS spoofing was a little, a little bit more insidious. Yes, that's right. Yeah, where they're basically confusing the aircraft. GPS jamming is a little bit more black and white. Uh, you know, the GPS is, it, it, the aircraft can receive the GPS uh, signals or it can't. Uh, uh, GPS spoofing is a little bit more insidious, as you say, because the, the aircraft can become confused. It can think that it's in one position when it really isn't and, and, and things of that nature. And at our uh, uh, meetings, um, we've had people do presentations on, on these topics, you know, which are incredibly interesting. And one of the reasons we are interested as a group in being involved in, in this podcast with, with you is um, rather than these presentations happening just within our membership and then, uh, you know, we take a bit away and then the, the, the presentation disappears into the ether, uh, we could actually deploy some of that here and, and, and we could bring that here and it could be a, a major technical dis discussion that you could have on the podcast, which we think is uh, a fabulous way of getting some of the information out of our group and out into the industry at large. Fantastic. No, so yeah, well, this this is what we're we're looking forward to to having some of your experts on the show uh, on the specialist group insight and into into doing more of a, a technical deep dive on, on on some of these fascinating topics. I mean, I think the other thing it's important to stress, Seth, for for viewers, uh, listeners, viewers and listeners, um, is is just how safe the industry is. The, the, the industry is. I mean, we we we've we've got a lot of. Obviously, been a lot of uh, uh, news uh, stories earlier this year. People have been worried about flying. There's been lots of sort of like uh, um, you know sensational headlines. But I think uh, you know one of the things that that strikes me is is gosh, you know all these people in the air at once and how few thing uh, you know, how how rare it is for things to go wrong. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it is an incredibly safe form of travel, uh, and, I, and I think we've we've come a long, long way over the decades uh, that that uh, people have been traveling by air. Um, but it is a slippery slope, you know, and we 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 realize that as a group, we we realize that we we've maintained an incredible safety record for for decades now, and uh, we at the flight ops group we want that to continue, you know, and uh, we we certainly want to be uh, part of the the global conversations and flight operations where we we can be and, and weigh in where we think that we should weigh in and um, uh, keep things moving forward in a in a safe and controlled manner. Brilliant. Okay. And, and the other thing I just want to, to mention, obviously, is uh, any events coming up? Uh, any? So you guys also organize conferences and uh, as well as your, your, your normal meetings, but you've got conferences and, and workshops and things like that. So we do. Yeah, we do. Uh, we'll have one coming up in March uh, 2025. Um, and uh, we're planning a, a conference, a full conference in Fort Hamilton Place on the topic of uh, flight deck reduced uh, uh, crew operations. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the, the aim of the conference is not to take a position, uh, you know, on whether or not we support or don't support flight operations. The aim is uh, uh, to get every, everyone, all the stakeholders in one room uh, and start discussing this, you know, uh, and it's looking like it's going to be quite uh, an exciting conference. Um, it's in the, the uh, I would say, the sort of early to, to mid stages of uh, planning right now. Uh, but we have a, a wonderful uh, gentleman by the name of Captain uh, Robert Scott, who is our chair of uh, conferences and events. Uh, and he's been putting a lot of work into this conference. Um, and I think that um, it would probably be, a, again, a, a little bit further down the line here, maybe in, in a couple of months. It'd be great to have him on. Uh, and, uh, and I think he would give a great rundown of what could be expected at that conference. So I would certainly uh, uh, earmark some time in March uh, 2025 for a conference in London. Brilliant. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, mark your diaries for that, everybody, because that that sounds like it's going to be uh, uh, it's a fantastic uh, event. Uh, look, um, I, we're coming to uh, end of time here. Uh, brief chat with you, Seth. Thanks so much for coming on on the podcast. I uh, hope to see you again, or or one of your experts uh, again, and to have uh, these regular updates. Uh, you know, specialist group insights, and have a have a real sort of technical uh, deep dive with you know a group really that's on the cutting edge of uh, you know shaping the debate about safety flight ops you know airline flight decks where are we going uh yeah fantastic thanks very much for your time it's an absolute pleasure thanks for having me and i look forward to being back okay bye and welcome back and uh, so that was our new segment uh, specialist group insight uh, where we're going out to uh, to, to our specialist groups and uh, it was a great discussion with, with, with Seth Moffat there 
from, uh, from chair of the flight operations group uh, and a taste of some more in-depth topics and discussions uh, we feature in future episodes. So the, the, the specialist groups, as uh, you heard them say, you know, real sort of, uh, uh, sort of the, the brains trust of the RAS, they're all volunteers, a uh, number of different uh, areas they look at. And, and the great thing I think talking with, with Seth was um, through, through his virtual meetings, they're getting people now joining from all around the globe yeah. and giving that, that perspective on yeah. flight ops from, from every single part of the world. Uh, yeah. so, I can't wait for some of the stuff they're going to be talking about, like uh, you know, GPS jamming and spoofing, single pilot ops. I can imagine that's going to be quite. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the, one of the, the great things about society is the specialist groups and the broad yeah. spectrum that they have. Yeah, everything from human-powered aircraft through to rocketry and yeah. RPAS and, and you name it. So, I guess that's what we were set up to do in 1866, and we're yeah. still doing today. So that, for me, is the really important work that society yeah. does. Yeah, no, it, it's fantastic also to, to, to talk to the real experts, you know, uh, not just people like me who regurgitate stuff uh, from other smarter people, as <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the real experts who are actually doing stuff, and, and you know, engineers, the pilots, uh, technicians, etc., etc. Yeah. So July 2024 issue. What what have we got in it? Let's have a look at to the July 24. So. Yeah, your FCAS thing. I mean, we have to start with it because we've spoken so much in the last two yeah. podcasts, maybe three, yeah. on our Future Combat uh, Aerosystems, Aerospace Systems Conference. I think your report sums up. You, and you've done a great job, Tim, in summing up three days worth of conference into four pages, was it? Uh, well, it had to be, yeah, it had to be uh, edited down severely, severely, severely <laughs> for the... For the uh, so yes. if you go on the website, there's a long version on the website, um, and we also got some, some interviews there, little video clips there with some of the people, some of the experts there. But yeah, great, great conference to report from, a lot of uh, ground covered on, on GCAP, on drones, uh, training, training. Mm. Of, uh, what, what does a, what does a fifth generation pilot, uh, you know, sort of even even look like? Um, and a great a great uh, keynote there from uh, Air Marshal Edward Springer, setting the scene there, you know, uh, as as uh, and introducing and then space as well. We had we had you know uh, uh, presentations on space, so it was a real tour de force of a of a, of a summit of a conference, uh, and hopefully some of the, the flavour there of, of what was going on. I think this is the second year we've done it now and it's great gaining momentum all the time isn't it? Yeah. So um, I think um, it's see what we do next year and it's, uh, it's getting better and better each time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what about you Bella? What have you written on this, this, this month? Yeah, I wrote an article that I've been writing, uh, researching for a long time um, over the past few months about space rescue and how obviously there are so many more people going into orbit than ever before and beyond. Um, and you know, at much bigger capacities, and we have so many more future programs like Artemis and you know Gateway and all that, all that part of the Moon, Mars, and beyond, with plans for a lot more people to go back to or go into space. Yet the topic of space rescue um, has kind of dwindled in the past few years. So uh, the article is basically not to give the entire thing away. But it's basically looking at how it was discussed in the 60s and, and when kind of the space race began and how it was a lot a lot more widely discussed um space rescue even just the um uh, learning from mistakes where you have a separate um capsule ready to go to space uh, on the on the port ready to go on the launch pad sorry not the port um so you didn't realise case. that until I until Yeah, it wasn't with every launch, but after yeah, learning... Then after Apollo 13, there was a Saturn sat there re- yeah. you know, waiting to, to go, and it was incredible. Yeah, and, and you know, but that doesn't happen anymore. No. If that was to happen now, it, it would take a long time. I'm sure they could, you know, get a launch quickly with SpaceX launching almost every day. But that's not the case. And so looking at kind of where did we fall away from that? Have we lost our way? And what are the things in kind of this modern space era that we can be doing just to increase the, not only the conversation about space rescue, but what are the things that companies should be doing? Because it's not just left in the government anymore, in the hands of the government, it's commercial companies. What should companies be doing? And some of those um, uh, topics were you know, international uh, docking ports and um, uh, possibly even having like a space rescue force in orbit. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these things are very futuristic, but uh, something that needs to be talked about now and it's interesting that it's not or you know it, it is now with several articles coming out um, similarly uh, and with some industry leaders kind of pioneering this conversation 
but it needs to be talked about now. It's crazy that it hasn't, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, like I say, it's very topical at the moment. Uh, yeah. Steve, <laughs> what, what have you been? Uh, what have you been writing about? What do you? What do you? I've been writing about Acaflinks. Acaflinks. Um, so the. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> bless you. Um, as um, regular listeners may remember, I went out to Aero Friedrichshafen in April, spoke about it at length, I think, in the last podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you may remember. Uh, so I was there with our, um, our current president of the Society, David Chin, and his theme for his presidential year is design, build, flying. He's taking his inspiration from the German Ackerflieg movement. So Ackerfliegs are the academic flying clubs, Ackerflieg academic flying clubs. Uh, so this is a system in Germany where universities have their own schemes where aeronautical students are working on aircraft. So they're not just doing the theory, they are designing, building and flying their own aircraft. And this is not assembling a kit plane they bought from somewhere else. This is actually, uh, you'll see in the article and some of the people we met at Project Sound, you've got universities that are developing flying wing, uh, uh, sort of fly-by-wire gliders yeah. that have got extendable aerofoil sections. Uh, so this is where Dave's taking his, his inspiration from. He's asking, is this something we could do in the UK? Because as, as he rightly says, there are lots of people coming out of university with all the knowledge, but have never touched wood, metal, yeah. fabric, composite to actually make an aircraft. So it's putting that theory into practice. And I think it's, it's a great concept and it was a really interesting article to research. Yeah. And he, he's got a, we've got a, his, his president conference is coming on in October, isn't it? And it's Design, Build, Fly. And a lot of the Ackerfleet members are coming in from across Europe. And I think what I found quite interesting is that a lot of these graduates from the Ackerfleets are now going on and working in the aerospace sector in, in Europe. So with uh, Airbus and Dassault and, and yeah. Grob and people like that within Europe. So it really does, it, it's sort of thing that, that sets a CV aside, you've got that practical experience when you go into the workplace. Work. Absolutely. So yeah, that I thought was a really interesting article. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, well, going back to the green, the, the green and sustainable aerospace, we've got an article in there from uh, Professor Keith, Keith Hayward, uh, uh, notable uh, expert on on green, uh, well, green air, future of green airliners, but also um, who's going to pay for the for the for, yeah. to, for the the investment for the R and D for the development uh, of these aircraft. Uh, if you think of something like uh, launch aid or launch subsidies uh, for something like you know converting hydrogen, you know hydrogen propulsion, yeah. it's not just the airline you're going to be launching; it's also the infrastructure, it's also the conversion to uh, you know airports and things like yeah. that. Uh, and is the possibilities of that to, to spark a new transatlantic trade war uh, yeah. with the WTO? Not the US and the EU it had a, a big spat about that. I wrote about it extensively. Airbus and Boeing, both of them uh, trading legal, um, you know, legal uh, barbs, legal insults between each other about who was supporting and, and what was this fair, etc., etc. Um, and now, you know, you're looking at these airliners and thinking, well, this, this, is, these are radical airliners. These are not just sort of derivatives we're, yeah. we're talking about here uh, in, in terms of configuration of fuel. Uh, is this going to kind of restart a new, uh, a new battle, uh, a trade battle? And then also, you've got the you've got the wild card there in China, you know, yeah. or, or yeah. somebody else yeah. getting involved. Uh, well, we've, we've seen, haven't we, that yeah, the NASA supporting the transonic trust race yeah. with Boeing. Yeah, how is that viewed here in Europe? So yeah, I think it's going to be interesting times. Yeah. Yeah. What else have we got in this, uh, this issue? Yeah, well, we have an article, our first article, I believe, from our Next Generation board. Yes. Next yeah. Generation yeah. Writers, yeah. which is really cool. So some younger um, writers writing in our magazine, all things that are related to them. Um, and so this article is really, really interesting. Basically, the careers of the future, which I think is our... It is our front cover, yeah. Front cover. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, written by Brody Stanhope uh, from, from the Next Generation Board, basically talking about what are the careers that are going to be in the future, literally, <laughs> in the name. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, not, not just five years from now, but, you know, decades in the future. What are we looking at? What are the types of careers that people could be getting into? Because I think it's really important to think of this now. Because even indirect skills will apply mm -hmm. in the future. It doesn't, not to not encourage people to go into aerospace, but you know, things that uh, may, maybe separate could be really relevant in the future. Yeah. So some careers like asteroid miner, which is, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, in orbit refueler, three D printing specialist, 
cryogenics engineer and the list goes on, I won't give it all away. But it's a really great article and I think really inspiring to see like how exciting even this yeah. industry is, like how fun all this stuff is. That's good, and, and having that on our front cover, I think it's going to be really interesting to take that to Farnborough. Yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. So this is our Farnborough issue, so uh, yeah. actually the Friday's Careers Day at, at Farnborough, yeah. so hopefully we get that magazine into some hands and, and inspire the next generation of yeah. aerospace professionals. Uh, and if you are thinking of becoming an EV toll pilot, you're probably going to want, want to to, what, to read the next uh, 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 article well, in there um, about EV toll safety, what traffic a, collisions. What a segue. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Robert Jocelyn in River Riddle University has written a piece for us on EV toll safety. We, we've done lots on EV toll safety recently. Yeah. Uh, this is looking specifically at uh, traffic, co traffic collision avoidance system and traffic awareness systems and asking can the current systems that we use in aeroplanes, helicopters, translate across into the EV toll market? Yeah. Uh, without spoiling it, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, this, this is a very different technology and it's something that really needs to be built into the thinking now while we're still not quite on the on the drawing board, but we're coming up with these these future concepts. Yeah. And how are we going to in, to incorporate this traffic collision system into an environment which is surrounded by buildings and you know high density areas, which current aircraft are not exposed to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, and what else have we got? Um, to yeah. Start? So uh, to keep on the theme of advanced air mobility, uh, and we got to, uh, an article on wind racers. Uh, so this is a UK company with a drone. Uh, it's a logistics drone, but it's multi-purpose, twin-engined, uh, and uh, it's rapidly becoming sort of like the Jeep of the air or the DC-3 of small drones. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done tests. They've, they've Work with the Royal Mail, yeah. uh, postal yeah. delivery. They've landed it on HMS Prince of Wales, so that's uh, that's quite a possible use. Uh, it's been in the, going in the Antarctic, doing uh, sort of like scientific surveys, um, humanitarian stuff, yeah. firefighting. Really, really, um, you know, kind of. It's almost a sort of, sort of, sort of so, so simple. You're thinking, well, why didn't anyone else? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hasn't yeah. else do, done that? And it's it's a, it's a really UK success story. Yeah. You've seen this aircraft every, everywhere. It's also uh, apparently also been used in Ukraine, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really going on to be this multi-purpose, you know, all-in-one, uh, you know, multi-role and drone aircraft. Yeah, and for clarification, this isn't an EV toll. This is no. not a vertical no, no, takeoff. No. This is a conventional, yeah, internal combustion-powered. To, to call it a very big model aeroplane is very unkind, yeah. but it's got that sort of dimension of a very large yeah. model aeroplane. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I say, a great British success Rug, story. Rugged yeah. uh, utility, you know, yeah. uh, fantastic stuff. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's what's happening in uh, this issue. We've got a horse report from the ILA Berlin air show. Yeah. Uh, so you can catch up all the news from that. And um, after Berlin, we've got quite a bit of the after Berlin. Yeah, we do. I say this every month, but it's pretty packed this, this month as well. We've got a lecture from the Weybridge branch. Um, from Wing Commander, uh, Commander Terry Martin speaking about the Western Blots. We've got the launch of the Next Generation News, which I just spoke about. Um, several book reviews, which is nice, because the last few months we've had less. So we have a few more this month, um, a corporate partners directory, and then all the usuals like library visions, new member spotlight, elections, and so on. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think really think the, the Western Wasp lecture of the Boy Management was pretty cool because uh, somebody actually flew in in their Western Wasp to give the lecture. <laughs> Make your plug, go on. <laughs> made a buzz. Didn't they it? made a buzz. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, just a, another plea uh, to uh, you know, if you're out there, you're, you're, you're involved in one of our local branches, please do send your branch news, events, photos. Uh, send it to to Bella Richard, Richard's features over here, and we'll try and include it in the magazine if you can. So. Uh, coming up to the end of the podcast now, the video cast, uh, upcoming events, shout outs, what have we got kind of lining up? Well, next week uh, we've got the Fledglings of the Third Right Lecture by Dr. Victoria Taylor. Looking forward to that. Uh, really good uh, World War II, Battle of Britain, Luffle Head historian. Uh, she's going to be busting some myths about uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the idea of the, the clean Luftwaffe uh, there next week. We've got a sustainability workshop uh, happening as well. So if you're interested in shaping the future of uh, sustainable flight, that is uh, that is open for anyone to get involved with. Uh, details are on our website. Yeah. Applied Aerodynamics Conference. 16th and 17th, I, did, I was at the last Applied Aerodynamics Conference and it was really interesting. I really, it's not an area that I, I was particularly involved in prior to that, but found it absolutely fascinating looking at the latest developments. So. Uh, that's 16th and 17th, which is the start of a very busy week for us, isn't it? <laughs>
Yeah, so we've also got the Global Air Chiefs Conference there. We are media partners of the Global the RAF uh, Global Air Chiefs Conference. Uh, that is a high level air power uh, type event uh, with all the, the the heads of air forces coming along to that. Uh, so uh, that's going to be something to look out for. React as well. We've got React ha happening uh, 19th to 21st of uh, July. So uh, we'll be out there on, on one of the days at yep. least. Uh, and then we've got Farnborough. 20, 22nd. We'll be there. We'll be there. We'll be there. En masse, yes. We'll be there. Uh, so there will be, uh, yeah, there'll be a whole team there. Uh, so do send us your news under embargo if you've got hot news. Uh, do send us uh, that way. So we'll be doing our, our daily blogs for yeah. Barbara's. So there'll be one going out on the Monday morning and then each of the days. So uh, if you want to get your news to us before that, we'll try and get you in early in the week. Yeah. And, um, Oh, it's going to be a good year, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of it's going to be an interesting farm. Right? Yeah, there's already some some interesting stuff out there being lined up for the uh, for the air display for static. You know, uh, Turkish trainers, Turkish helicopters, F fifteen uh, QA. Yeah, it's, yeah, fly by wire F fifteen with fly by wire. Wow, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that that was that was a brilliant display in Dubai, wasn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, no, we'll see you there, and we'll also be doing a video podcast roundup at the end of the week. Um, and so yeah, what, so finally, what have we all been watching, reading, playing? Uh, Steve, you've been reading uh, was it a, a, a book on air racing. I can do it this time. We've got a video. Yeah. <laughs> I've been reading the Air Racer, uh, which is actually a nineteen seventies book that I found on eBay. It's by Charles Medenhall. And I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to see that, but it's full of blueprints of iconic air racing aeroplanes going right the way back to the dawn of flights. Wow. Um, but then right up to obviously 70s things. There's lots of, there's a Cassidy Air Racer, uh, Rare Bear, the Bearcat. So it's just, uh, I'm not a modeler, but I think if you are a modeler, you get some yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah. Look at that. Speed Spitfire. And these, these are all sort of hand, hand drawn. They're all hand drawn infographics, really, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's the, again, it appeals to my inner geek. Yeah. As an inner geek or an outer geek or just a complete geek. But <laughs> that's my book for the month. Brilliant. What about you? Anything? Um, <laughs> that was terrible at this section. I do have things that I want to watch. <laughs> what did you, no, no, you, you said. What was it? Uh, Godzilla. <laughs> I did watch Godzilla. Yeah, and there is a doctor's What was it? it? There was a, there's a, uh, a, a like J7. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was cool. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> J7D, was it? Shindin? Yeah, Shindin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shindin. Yeah. That was very cool, actually. That was a surprise. Spoiler, there is oh, a World War II Japanese thing. Yes. Oh, it was very, yeah. very cool. It was like like we're just giving the game away now. Okay, to, no, no, to, no, to, no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, oh, save the day. That was actually. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry if you were, we were just that last year. If you were an aviation fan and you were just thinking of watching Godzilla, then yeah, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what, what about, about you? Go on. All right, so, uh, so Hercules, uh, Scott Bateman, uh, ex Hercules, uh, RF Hercules, but I'm really reading his book there, uh, all about the, the history of the Hercules uh, and uh, his, his career in the RAF, but also some of the things he did. You know, landing on the carrier. Mm. Uh, landing on an aircraft carrier, not just once, they, you know, they, they did several times. Mm -hmm. um, stuff in there that, that just makes your eyes uh, go, you know, uh, really good book and, and what a classic aircraft. You now, talk, you talked about the DC-3 earlier, it, yeah. it is the, you know, the DC-3 of the next generation, isn't it? Yeah, so some, some hair-raising uh, hair raising exploits in there, you know, NTAB raid, uh, dropping, pe dropping people into the, into the North Atlantic, dropping people into the, into the South Atlantic parachuting yeah. there, uh, uh, and, and all sorts of uh, the wild adventures uh, there in Hercules, uh, what, what aircraft, and also the crews that, that fly them, you know, yeah. very, very strong bond, uh, because you're in this big crew, and you're you're there, you know, you you, you go away for, for several months on end, you know, in these detachments and what have you, and, and you're, you're you're going around the world as the the, the, the sort of truckies, um, and then also uh, scramble, uh, Battle of Britain flies them. So this is a this is like a one of my video game games I get I get excited about. Uh, this is a 3D uh, turn-based tactical wargaming thing, uh, wargaming uh, PC wargame uh, about dog playing. Uh, and oh, it's, nice. it's, it's literally right on my street of uh, planning your moves and you've got these ribbons. So if you've seen the poster for Battle of Britain in 1969, there's, there's, there's two sort of ribbons coming up and they're, they're, they're you know, a bit of a mission across it. 
Imagine that in turn based, and you're planning to where to get that. So it's more of a strategy game yes. than actually flying. Yeah, so you're, you're, not fly, you're not you're not flying oh, okay. it. You're giving it, you know, and you've got plenty of time to think about it. Okay. Uh, and there, but there's realistic things, physics in there, so you can stall out. You can uh, you can kind of um, you know you can over g the well you can over g the pilot, so you black out. Are you competing against other people or? At the moment, it's due to it's, it's a versus AI. Yeah. Uh, oh, but there is a demo there on out on Steam. It's still up as a, a time of uh, time of recording this, so. If you have a look at Scramble Battle of Britain on Steam, Steam is where you get all the, all the, all the games lie, uh, uh, hang out, uh, you can have the free demo. But I think it's, it's, the physics is there, the, uh, the, kind of, the whole concept is there. It's something that I've not seen before, the turn-based air combat is, uh, yeah. is great. Subject to Battle of Britain, I was at Cywell Air Show a couple of weekends ago, Richard Gracie's fantastic air show. They had the Battle of Britain film playing on a big screen in the hangar with the bar, which was serving aviation-themed beer. <laughs> and on one side, they've got Spitfire and H415, and on one side, they've got a Hispano Bouchon, both of which had appeared in the Battle oh, of Britain wow. movement. Oh, wow. And it's like, I'm that's still just... To watch it. Now you tell me. <laughs> but, but yeah, so yeah, congratulations to Richard and the team. Air show of the season, hands down, absolutely brilliant. Wow, yeah, okay. Uh, fantastic. So we're going to the end of the uh, the, the, the pod now. Uh, so finally, where, where can people keep up with the Arias and the Mag? Um, me, uh, I'm on R A E S Steve B, and you'll also find me as Stephen with a P H Stephen Bridgewater on LinkedIn and on Facebook. Yeah, and you can find me R A E S Bella R on X. Uh, and R A S Tim R on X, and obviously we've got Society dot com uh, for all your. Uh, Society, we've got the Society, the Insight Blog there, twice a week Insight Blog. And we're now on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, uh, Carrier Pigeon, you name it, we're Carrier on. Carrier Pigeon. <laughs> uh, and, and views, questions, feedback, uh, do send them in. We're, we're interested in whether you're, you're enjoying it, whether you want to, what, what topics you want to see, what topics would you like to see from our specialist groups? Have you got burning questions that you'd like them to answer? Uh, you know, do, do write in, do, do tweet us, do, do X us. Uh, tweet us, yeah, us uh, respond on Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever we are, and uh, yeah, it's an interesting interview. Until next month, then. It's goodbye for me. Bye, guys. It's goodbye for me. Take Bye. care.